rim of the Mari Embry in the Sea of Storms. That morning as we left the earth, it was a great feeling to know where we were going and what we wanted to do when we got there. After we cleared the tower, my thoughts briefly went out to those of my family who were standing just a few miles away, my wife and our children and my dear little mother. And I wonder if my mother would understand what I was trying to do. Did I understand? I don't know that I completely understood what all was involved in such a flight. Many surprises on the flight. Oh, it was a, a rich experience. It was high adventure. Greatly changed my life. Changed the way I look at myself, the way I look at others, the way I view you. And I would like you to share that new perspective. So tonight, I would like to take you out into space. See if you also feel like almost an angel. And so if we have the lights turned down, we'll begin our journey to the moon. for this special place that God has made. I hope that you will experience a, a high flight, that your spirit might be lifted. Man has always looked into space and wondered what was there. Those that met at Stonehenge many years ago, as they viewed the moon, probably wondered, what could we find if we could somehow reach the moon? Those were our feelings before our flight. The patch that we designed clearly shows the moon, and shows our desired landing spot and happy base. <coughs> Al Gordon stayed in orbit while Dave Scott and I went down to land on the surface. We were flying in the, over those mountains that are 15,000 feet high, and we land next to a canyon called Hadley Rill. Now we're back on Earth. We're getting ready for the flight. We're placing us in the space. That's Jim Irwin. You probably wouldn't recognize me. I want you to notice how weird Al Warden looks. But Al never did like to get up early. There's Dave Scott. They drove us out to the launch pad. There's our rocket and our spacecraft way on top. Again, launch control. We're lying in the rocket, waiting and wondering. Well, we're not waiting any longer. For me, this was the most thrilling part of the flight. To send seven and a half million pounds of thrust, lifting us very precisely off the earth and clear of the tower. Then we breathe a little more easily. This tremendous power lasts for about 12 minutes. The end of that time, we're then orbiting the earth. We went around the earth twice. We launched out for the moon. Later that afternoon, we had our first opportunity to look back and see the earth, as few men would see. See the earth, very small but indescribable view. The Earth appears about the size of a basketball. Then bounce like this, we just didn't hold the camera very steady. Three Earth days later, we approach the surface of the moon. We're looking out my window and we're trying to find Hadley Base. We know it's out there somewhere, but it's difficult to find because of all the craters. In our case, we're very lucky because there are three craters in a row that point like an arrow to Hadley Base, and we pre-named them Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You can imagine our great relief Enjoy when we look out and see those three craters. Now we know we can come straight down and we'll be at the right spot. And as we come down, we pick up a layer of dust with our rocket exhaust that makes it necessary to transition to instrument flight. We get to the proper distance, we shut down the engine, and we fall. We hit it very hard. It was all the hardest landing ever been in. I was amazed the lunar model stayed in one piece. I'm just glad we had cables attached to our spacesuits or we might have gone right through the window. Once we hit, the dust immediately settled. We looked out the window and found we're sitting right on the edge of Luke Crater. So we're right on target after traveling a quarter of a million miles. Al Wharton's 
orbiting above us. He looks down to see if we've arrived safely. Dave and I were to camp and explore this region of the moon for three days. We were so impressed with the scenery, we took a lot of photographs. Typical tourists. <laughs> this is a panorama. This is our communications antenna. To the north, we can see Pluton Crater in the northern complex, an area of great interest to the science. And to the northwest, we can make out the edge of the canyon. It's about two miles in that direction. This is the radar antenna which we needed to find our command line. As we look at the surface, I think you'd agree that it looks like, like the deserts of the Earth. Very few trees. In fact, we didn't see one tree. Not even a cactus. You know, nothing growing at all. A world where life has never existed. A completely dead world. In such a sharp contrast with the Earth where life abounds. To the south, we see one of the Apennine Mountains. This is Mount Hadley Delta, 13,000 feet high. The base of the mountain is five miles to the south, and that's where we made one of our very important discoveries. It was there that we found the white rock that was labeled Genesis. Dave and I were very surprised to see so many rock layers exposed in this cliff to the south. Each layer is 300 feet thick. We named this after one of our favorite geology professors. You will see Dave come down our front stairs and he prepares to go to work his first day on the moon. And he makes it look so easy. But his last step was not a small step for man. It was a much bigger step for me. He bounced around for a few minutes to adjust to this new environment where everything would weigh one-sixth of what it had on the earth. Then he backed away from the lunar module and he made the statement it was man's basic nature to want to explore. Mission girls wondering what's taking Jim Irwin so long to get out. I was always getting stuck in the front door. But finally I struggled free. I come down much slower because my legs are shorter. And I come down very cautiously, reaching for the moon. I found it and I tripped. I stumbled and I thought I was going to fall over in my backside. And I was so embarrassed because I realized that millions of people are watching on television. <laughs> but fortunately, I recovered my balance, but that's why I went out of the field of view of the television. One of life's embarrassing moments. This is the deployment of our little automobile because we took the first car to the moon, pulling on straps to lower it. Amazing capability in a very small package. But then when you pay $8 million for a car, you're expecting something rather special. And we did get a very special car. The first car for another world. Once we get it down, we, we have to test it. This is the first motion of Rover 1. Dave drives around to the front door. He picks me up, and we go off a little spin. And we did spin many times. Before we go for any long trip, we must load some important equipment to include our picnic lunch. Mount Hadley Delta, a large crater on the right flank we call St. George. It was a challenge to name most of these features around our campsite. Then we'll go for a ride on the car. I suggest you pass your seatbelt because it's going to be a rough ride as we try to avoid the rocks and craters. We'll be going at our maximum speed. 10 miles an hour. But for some reason it seemed very fast on the moon. This is the television. I hope that you can see these tracks on the surface. Dave and I are returning on our second day of exploration. When we find these tracks, we decided it would probably be a good idea to follow them. Because they'd probably take us to our campsite. We thought it would be horrible to get lost on the moon, run out of oxygen. So you can see we're just following our tracks home. To the right of the camera, we can now see the highest mountain close to us, Mount Hadley, 15,000 feet high. But the base of the mountain is 20 miles away. We were never able to get over to the base of the mountain because it was too far away. But I think it gets some idea of the difficulty we had in estimating heights and distances. We were always off 50 to 100 percent. Poor Boy Scouts. But no convenient yardstick there for measurements, no trees, no telephone poles, and no air. It really seemed like you could see forever. 
Now we're looking into the canyon called Hadley Rill. This canyon is 1,000 feet deep, 4,000 feet across. We're looking for water, but we don't find any. Dave was fascinated by the rocks that he saw in the bottom of the canyon. He suggested we jump on that car and drive down in there to get some. I said, Dave, you want to do that? Go ahead. But I'm going to stay right here. Because I can just imagine driving down in there getting stuck. It would have been almost impossible to climb up because we just didn't have any extra oxygen in our space suit. Then I drive a hollow tube into the surface to get a sample of the soil. These tubes went in so easily, I could have pushed them in by hand, but it just looked a little more professional to use the hammer. Then I hit my thumb. <laughs> then we drove over to Dune Crater. This is about a half a mile across. We sample the rocks on the near rim. And then we'll look at the face of Mount Hadley. It's 15,000 feet high. I want to see if you agree with our assessment of our observations. These parallel lines across the face of the mountain. Dave and I decided they had to represent layers of rock. When we returned to the Earth, we raised quite a controversy. Initially, some scientists agreed with us, others said, no, it's a fracture pattern. Now, the most accepted theory is these lines are an illusion, just a function of the sun angle. So you see, we've been successful at answering some questions, but we've raised many more. But I think you'd agree that that's healthy and typical of man's quest for knowledge. I think as long as we continue to explore, we'll continue to raise many questions. But I still maintain it looks like layers of rock. I hope that some of you will agree with me. I'm a little hard-headed. Must be my Scottish background. Here I'm raising the central station of our scientific base, the base that made the moon a more valuable satellite of Earth. While I'm doing this, Dave is using the lunar drill. Now, this was quite a difficult operation. Here he's exerting all his available weight without much success. I thought with the struggle Dave's having, he's going to hit something important, like water or petroleum. They just hit rock. But he did get a good core sample about 10 feet deep. This is the Galileo experiment where Dave is dropping a hammer and a falcon feather to see if they'll fall at the same rate in the vacuum. You know, we wanted to practice this before we did it in front of television, but we ran out of time. So we're just holding our breath and hoping that it works. It worked. What a relief that was. Now we have more confidence we can return. It's time to come home. I'm coming up the, the front stairs, through the door. It's a tight squeeze, but by this time I had a lot of practice getting in and out. And you can see how fast I get in. The rock that you wanted is the and almost immediately, someone in the press room down and used to label it Genesis. Because they obviously knew how important it would be. An important key to understanding the early history of the moon and perhaps the early